no matter what we think about our loved ones, whether it's our children, our parents, our partners, lovers, friends, none of them has the obligation to love you. None of them. Nobody has to love you. Yes, you might expect, you might want that your darling children love you, but they don't have the obligation to do that. The only person whose love you can reasonably expect is your own. James Shramko here. Welcome to my podcast. This is episode 1017. Today we're going to be talking about becoming flawsome uh, with Christina Mandlakiani. Welcome to the call. Thank you, James, so much for having me. Yeah, look, it's always good to catch up. I've seen you in real life several times, uh, sometimes when I visit conferences. Uh, we've even had some meals together, which has been great and uh, been in many different countries, <laughs> which is amazing. And it's great to see what you're doing. Of course, some people recognize the surname. You co-founded Mind Valley with your then husband, Vision, and he's been on the show too. So it's really great to just sort of round out. Uh, maybe we'll get another generation in the future. Who knows? <laughs> You've been pretty busy. You're an entrepreneur, writer, speaker, philanthropist, mother, and you've been pretty heavily involved in the personal transformation industry. And, and I believe you took it to Russia, uh, which must have been a fascinating venture. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for welcoming me. And, you know, when I saw your name in my calendar, I felt so, so comfortable. I was like, oh, thank God someone I know. So uh, thank you for that. I, I totally share in the in the pleasure of talking to someone that you know in real life. And actually, you do know me from the time when I was doing Mind Valley in Russia. Uh, I get quite often that question in the English speaking market. So where have you been? Because I've been a co-founder of Mind Valley from, from the beginning, which is 20 years ago. And of course, people are surprised. Where have you been? Uh, uh, well, I worked in Russian market until uh, recent events, so uh, I'm not new to that industry, but I'm very new to the English-speaking audience. I wondered, uh, I heard somewhere, and I'd, I'd have to ask you if this is true or not, is it true that in the Russian market there weren't some of the actual words to describe self-help? Uh, until until now, well, a lot of a lot of the new ideas come to Russia from uh, English speaking world. I'm not sure if that's going to continue, but for uh, the 30 years past Soviet Union, that has been the case. So some of the words, since uh, actually, you know, translation was one of the professions I got as a child, like a long long time ago. I know that a lot of translations have been done inaccurately, and a lot of meanings have been a little twisted. But yeah, even even my book title is uh, is a huge question. We still don't know how it's going to be translated. Wow, that's that's something so personal, and it must be must be one of those things that actually could be quite a difficult decision to be involved with because you're so close to it. I've I've enjoyed learning about that market through watching movies, of course. You know, like the Chernobyl series I watched, and um, I watched one about Tetris, which was fascinating. And I know they're all uh, made for movies. But it's, it's really interesting that you've made that translation and I'm sure you've helped a lot of people with the work that you've been doing and you're about to help a whole lot more. Uh, you have a book, Becoming Flawsome, and it'd be great to talk about that today. Yeah, you know, uh, on your on your previous remark, uh, I feel like I was Don Quixote, you know, <laughs> fighting the windmill sometimes trying to translate certain concepts and uh, and. Um, convey certain concepts and, and Russian market has been very curious because in essence people are the same but then our background does influence very much our perception of things. I have stepped away from that market uh, now and I'm uh, fully immersed in English speaking language and uh, enjoying it very much. In fact, you know, I started writing my book in Russian because I had uh, many more contacts in Russia and I had contacts to, to the um, publishers there, the biggest publishers there and everything. But then, uh, as I started writing, I remembered that classical song, if you have made it here, you've made it everywhere about New York. <laughs> and I thought, no, I, I'll, I'll start in English. I won't do it in Russian. And that was before the war. So, of course, nowadays it would have been even more complicated. But, yeah, about my book, it's uh, it's my baby. I've been in personal growth for 20 years, and I guess it was bound to happen. <laughs> yes, yeah, so you've been at this for a while. And you did actually live in New York for a while there, too. So you said that there's 10 years worth of therapy in one book <laughs> it wasn't me <laughs> it was my my editor who uh my first editor my book has had i think five or seven editors it's insane amount how do you end up with five editors i'm curious 
Yeah, it's a, it's the process. We, we <laughs> I, I think we we can talk a separate show about writing a book. Uh, <laughs> no, I just general. did a, I just did an episode not long ago about writing books and editing, and it it's so difficult. Yeah, I won't go into that, but I'll give you a little bit of a premise or the context to that. So my book is about being true to yourself and finding your path back to you. Uh, we um, all get lost. Uh, as we live our life and aspire for our goals, at some point we forget what's the true human inside is. So my my book is about that, about finding your path back to you. So naturally I wanted it to be, well, very much me. I wanted to self-publish <laughs> because I thought that's the only way to be able to make my own decisions about the book, about what to write, how to write. Uh, and I, I wrote it to be self-published, but of course, it doesn't mean that I would skip on the process. So I found an editor, a professional editor, who is also a ghostwriter, although not for my book. I wrote my book myself. She was my first editor. Uh, she loved the book. She said it's uh, like 10 years worth of therapy in one book. Uh, but then when it came time to actually publish, uh, again, I thought that I want to give my book baby the best possible start in life. So I want to at least attempt to make it to New York Times bestsellers and all those lists. And that meant I needed to find a publisher. So in the process of finding a publisher and working with a publisher, a whole bunch of other editors <laughs> jumped on my book and, and left their mark in it. <laughs> oh, that's funny. So this really sort of touches on one of the topics that you cover, which is authenticity what it actually is, it sounds like you needed this book to be authentic and it had to find its pathway but not be compromised along the way. Yeah, it is it is uh, it is a battle for a lot of us, but uh, a lot of the battles we fight unconsciously. So because being true to yourself was on the surface in, in this book, uh, I was very aware of what's going on. So even when we found the publisher, when my publisher Hay House finally got their hands on my book and it came back from the last publisher and that was already a few rounds into into editing. Uh, so when it came back from from Hay House's uh, editor, it had something like one thousand four hundred corrections. It's a lot for a two hundred eighty eight page book. It's a lot, and it was a painful experience uh, because uh, some of the corrections were well. The thing about the punctuation and language it doesn't bug me. It's just uh, it's just the form. But when it comes to the essence of the book, you know what stories to leave, what stories to to remove. There was a whole chapter removed, which happens to be my favorite chapter in the whole book, and that was such a battle because uh, we face that battle sometimes. Do you stay true to your values to yourself, or do you compromise what's important to you for a chance at success? You see, if I'm working with a big publisher, uh, of course, I'm tempted to listen to the advice because they've published so many books. So don't I want to be successful? Very often we are told to change something about ourselves because somebody says, but that's what you need to do to be successful. Take any sphere. You go on stage. You get off stage. There are well-meaning people who come and say like, oh, but now you need a speaking training because you are, you know, something. They, they don't like something, but maybe that's what you are. That's the way you are. Or social media. Oh, no, no, no. You can't do your social media like that because nobody does it like that anymore. This is not going to take you anywhere. So you always have this question. Do I stick to my own principles and my values or do I listen to what the so-called experts tell you uh, and follow that path? And sometimes I felt like I had to sell my soul to the devil just so that I have a chance to be successful. Yeah, that was a battle. <laughs> and did the chapter make it in the book? My book is a balance. I actually, I did allow the first um, part to be massively edited, but uh, by part number two, and I have eight parts, uh, my heart was aching so much. I actually went back to that first editor of mine and I, and I, I had to cry on her shoulder. <laughs> it's just too painful. And she said, but Christina, that's editor's work to leave red marks in your book because if they don't, they haven't done their job. And then she said, it's your book you have the right to uh, decline all the edits, which I did after part two. Well, not all, but almost all. And surprise, surprise, nobody said anything. They said, okay, good. <laughs> Let's go. Let's go. And that's, that's the weird thing. We sometimes think we have to do certain things that we are advised to do, but then do we? Well, I think anyone with kids knows that, that definitely there's some flexibility on the hard lines, right? I'm glad to hear that that you're able to to get the best of both worlds, that mass distribution, but also with what you really wanted to publish. You talk about dragons 
that basically you can't vanquish the dragons. They're still going to be there. And this probably was a bit of a dragon breathing fire at you. Can you talk about how that metaphor works? Well, yeah, the my obstinacy and <laughs> desire to be um, authentically me, like not to compromise, is definitely a, a bit of a dragon. Uh, now, it's funny because I hardly ever have to define dragons because people somehow understand what it means. But uh, I use the word dragons in my book as a, a general term for anything which we feel is our flaw, uh, our weakness, something that makes us feel less than, less worthy, uh, unprofessional, not good enough, you know, all those things, all our self-doubts, uh, whether it's your qualities, your uh, personality traits, your, well, past experience, traumas, the, I call, I give them the general term dragons, because these are, these are the fire-breathing creatures uh, who <laughs> kind of make you very uncomfortable about yourself. I think in this process, I learned that, that uh, you can't slay your dragons <laughs> because sometimes when you slay your dragon, you uh, you cut off a piece of uh, what makes you you. So I was curious about that. When I was mentioning to a friend of mine today, we had a surf and I said, I'm really looking forward to having a chat to Christina because she's got this cool book. And we were just wondering, I wonder when you say it's okay to accept you how you are, et cetera, uh, that you're awesome as you are, where do things like um, physical appearance or being overweight fit into that? <laughs> well, these are two different things, right? Because uh, being overweight is definitely not my uh, area of expertise, so I wouldn't want to give advice on that. Although being uh, unhealthy and unfit and having, let's say, damaging habits, and I'm not talking about just not going to the gym or eating anything you like, but actual damaging habits like smoking for example. Well, I was, so I said to my friend, what if you just uh, like an angry person or you behave badly? You know, is it okay to say, well, that's just that's just their dragon? No, no, no. Uh, so there are a few distinctions we have to make. Uh, and and I, I guess the, the context to that is that our society is a little bit superficial and we don't like depth. We like simple solutions, surface solutions. That's why we're getting into troubles because we don't bother to go deeper. Now, when it comes to self-love or self-acceptance, you have to go deeper. Otherwise, you will have all those distortions like I have an obvious bad habit, which obviously is ruining my life, but take me as I am. No, that's not what I'm saying. There is a difference between having a bad habit or having, um, having a tendency to a certain behavior, which is destructive, not just to yourself, but to the world around, and having certain qualities about you. Now, the people who are angry, there is a difference between feeling extreme emotions or getting very easily unsettled or having a very keen sense of justice versus being rude. These are very different things. I'm not saying you have to be rude. I'm saying that you have to recognize that you are the person who gets angry easily. So that you can't change probably. Probably your reaction to the world is in some way, of course, we, we're taking it superficially again. I, I guess you can become less angry. <laughs> so is it about taming your dragon? Say, okay, I have this dragon, but I'm going to tame that dragon and, and be aware of it and protect myself from uh, situations. There is a difference between you staying true to yourself and you just being rude. And very often when people say, I'm just being honest, it's a pretext to an insult or uninvited comment coming out. Being honest doesn't mean that you have to profess your so-called truths left and right, or offer your so-called truth to people when they're not asking about it. Now, on the other hand, when you feel like you are out of place, or you're doing something which goes against your values, Ejecting yourself politely out of uh, this environment is perfectly fine. But let's say snapping at someone, being angry, being mean, being unreasonable because they have crossed your boundaries, that's not fine. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that whatever you are, it's fine. But you still get to choose how you act, how you react to the world, how you interact with people. And that choice has to come from your values, probably more than from your natural inclinations. A very drastic example would be, you can walk on the street and find someone super hot and attractive. It doesn't mean you're going to jump on that person and try to <laughs> try to take them in the place because we are humans. We are, uh, we are capable of uh, disconnecting our urges from our actions. 
Gotcha. That's a really good explanation. I appreciate that because I think some people might take your message as having permission to just, you know, continue bad behaviour or have bad outputs. But I really like that differentiation. I have to apologise though because uh, if people take my message on the surface, of course they may misunderstand it. Mm. And how many things have been taken out of context that people uh, don't get it? That's why, that's why in one of my earlier chapters, I talk about actually giving up that superficial layer of our understanding of the world and trying to see the essence of things, because this is one of the biggest problems that we as a society have. We're too lazy to look deeper into the essence of things. We're so used to shortcuts. So, yeah, my message is that's the problem with self-love. It's so misunderstood. If you talk about it in simple terms, people will take it out of context and will willfully misunderstand it. If you want to understand it, you have to take it layer by layer by layer and go deep. I think that's wise advice, especially in, a, in an era where short videos and social media, you know, people are, their little bubble is so different to everyone else's little bubble. I mean, if you live in a different place, and you have a different culture and you, you get exposed to different preferences. It's amazing even if you pick up your partner's phone and start browsing on social, you'll be shown all a different world, like all these different things based on targeting and all the rest of it. To that point, there is a bit of a dark side to personal growth and insecurities. Can you talk more about that? Because you're so experienced in this personal development world. Well, I think uh, personal growth industry is like any other industry and uh, any sphere of life. There is the good side of it and there are obviously traps and, and difficulties and extremes. In fact, I have a theory that whatever quality you take or whatever emotion you take, if you take it to the extreme, it can be destructive. I was doing a chart of emotions for my book. It has like 300 different nuances of emotions. And I realized that whatever emotion, base emotion that I took, whether it's anger or love, if I went into all the intricacies and different nuances of it, both anger and love, which are very often contradicted, have good and, well, so-called good, good and bad uh, bad nuances to that. So the same with personal growth industry. Definitely, it's a good thing. But there are distortions, there are traps, and there are extremes, like compare it to general education or the primary education or religion. Of course, the essence of religion is good. It's uh, your spirituality. It's your connection with God. But how much of the religion has been taken to the extreme? Primary education, same story. It's good that kids know how to read and write and uh, mathematics, but how many things go wrong? How many traumas are uh, created by those very systems which actually were created for good in the very beginning? So the same with personal growth and education, uh, sorry, personal growth and transformation industry. People come to it out of the best intentions. They want to be a better version of themselves. Now, I could talk about different aspects of where it can go wrong, but let's say, let's take it from my point of view, and I'm talking about self-love and self-acceptance. Very often, our obsession with perfectionism is the exact source of the dark side and the dragons, because we have the picture of what it means to be the best version of James or the best version of Christina, and we strive for that, which is in, in the essence of our industry, you have the goal, you go for that goal, and you look for the tools how to reach your goal. But what happens is that very often we don't have the practical skills to deal with the fact that our aspirations and reality have a massive void between them. Our aspirations are by definition different from reality. Yet when it comes to the picture of perfection, if you realize there is something about you which doesn't correspond to that picture of perfection, that gap between your aspiration and reality creates a very serious internal conflict. Nobody has taught us how to deal with that. So, for example, I'm a woke, loving person, and I practice love and compassion for everyone. And suddenly, you feel really upset with someone, and you can't even place your finger on that. So how do you deal with that? Because that emotion contradicts your picture of perfection. So very often what we do is we start tricking ourselves, we start avoiding that, we start, you know, hiding it in the darkest corner. That's why, that's how actually obsession with perfectionism creates the dark side. Because we are so focused on the aspiration that we're completely incapable of dealing with the actual reality, which is by definition different from our aspiration. Gosh, it's, it's amazing, you know, as you're saying that I'm seeing this manifest itself a lot when in a business context, I get a lot of people coming with this a goal. It, it's always $10 million a year, by the way. <laughs> the people, always. It's always $10 million a year and it's placed there by all the things they've seen in the benchmarking and there's often a very big gap 
between capability or talent or reality of, of being able to achieve that. And then the funny thing is, even if they can, when they get there, they're not happy. They're miserable. And they, you know, I wish it could be just simple like back in the old days. So I love that saying, know thyself, right? I do think it's good to, to get inside and to think about this. this is why I love having topics like this. You know, a quarter of what I do revolves around that mindset and the person, the founder behind the business, if, if they're not right, the business doesn't have a great chance. Yeah. I, I guess it definitely depends on the business model. And I believe since you're coaching people, you mostly deal with people who create business around their, themselves and around their... Pretty much yeah, smaller businesses, you know, lots, just like uh, the hundreds of thousands and the sort of multi-millions several million dollars. I'm, I'm not saying like small, small or bigger, but I guess people who are like creating businesses for flipping or are into investment, they they have slightly different <laughs> uh, different mechanics of, of how they do and what they do. But uh, I'll tell you one thing from personal growth, from 20 years in personal growth, it's a huge myth that to become a better person, you have to just focus on that picture of your aspirational picture of perfection, or as they say, fake it till you make it. It's a huge myth, somewhat more illustrative analogy. When you drive your car and you try to go to a place that you do not know, for example, I live in Europe, in Tallinn, I can drive from Tallinn to Paris. So I want to go to Paris. I place a spot in the navigation of my car, Paris. The navigation will only start working when it knows what is my uh, departure point. Because a path to Paris from Tallinn and from London will be very different. That's what a lot of people in personal growth don't understand. Uh, not just personal growth, and personal growth is just more on the surface. Because we don't have the skills to deal with a reality which is not the aspiration yet, what we tend to do is that we so focused on aspiration as if we are trying to ignore the reality or pretend that it's not there or say, yes, maybe I was there, but now I'm jumping. You don't drop into Paris out of the blue skies. You have to drive there from point A into point B. So any transformation is only going to happen when you're two legs planted in your point A and you accept what you are, you know what you are, and you move from there. It sounds like responsibility. It sounds like ownership and stepping up to confront reality. I've often said, look in the mirror, that person there is the one that's going to help you more than anybody it's 100% true because, you know, and I'm sure you know these kind of examples of people who would deny that they have a problem because their aspiration is not to have that problem, but they can solve it. Why don't we talk about the Hermione syndrome and how you could diagnose that, you know, if you happen to be secretly suffering from it? I think there'll be an interesting discussion. Normally, I don't diagnose people, but I would imagine that among your audience, about 80% are probably Hermione, <laughs> a little Hermione. <laughs> so Hermione syndrome is the term that I came up with. But in essence, uh, I mean, in, in popular literature, it's more known as, uh, as a combination of perfectionism and imposter syndrome. <laughs> well, a lot of people have imposter syndrome. So I think you, you bang on the money, especially people who are quite technically talented they tend to be perfectionists. I put a quote out the other day, actually, it was like sometimes being too uh, gifted at something can be quite a disadvantage because you get stuck in it and you can't let go. That's absolutely true, yeah. <laughs> and then you you don't do things that other people sillier than you do exactly. easily. Exactly, like how can that person, they don't even know where their domain's hosted or they couldn't build a website or whatever, but, but you know, you start tinkering around with that stuff. You won't actually go out there and meet people and make offers and sell things. So how do you fix the Hermione syndrome? Well, you don't fix. <laughs> <laughs> You're just aware of it. You say, okay, these are my dragons. So, you know, I'll, I'll confess, I don't know why I came up with this term because actually perfectionism is a pretty good term for that as well. I think because everyone on the planet loves Harry Potter. It's a, it's a great news jack. Yeah, and, and some people don't identify themselves with perfectionism, but uh, I've been researching this, uh, this sphere and there are uh, conditions which are very close to, uh, to being a perfectionist, so Hermione, with little nuances. So basically what it means is that uh, perfectionists usually have really high expectations and really high bar. Uh, they generally understand that they're pretty strong and pretty smart. Most people, they know when they're smart, most people. Of course, a lot of silly people also think that they're smart. <laughs> uh, but the problem with perfectionists is that they have very low tolerance of failure and very low tolerance of personal imperfection. 
And that's what prevents them from doing things. Uh, especially if we add to that something that we talked about earlier, or maybe I didn't talk to you about that, sorry. <laughs> there is this tendency in our world uh, where uh, we uh, deal out love as a reward for good behavior. Uh, we learn it from childhood and we carry it into our, our grown-up life. So that mechanism is what uh, blocks perfectionists, Hermione's and, and other people like that, underdogs sometimes, from doing things. Because you're, when you have a low tolerance of failure and low tolerance of uh, your personal imperfections, you are afraid of challenging yourself. And because you're afraid of challenging yourself, because you're afraid of failure, you would rather not go into things. And there is such an idea, especially in perfectionist said, that there is being an absolute best and everything else is a failure. So if I write a book, I'm either New York Times bestseller author or I'm a failure. If I'm doing a project, I either uh, blow everybody out of you know, the water or I'm a failure. If you go into a contest, you're either number one or you're a failure. And because of that very black and white approach to, uh, to failure, because literally everything is failure unless it's absolute best, uh, and your low tolerance for failure and the subconscious programming that you only deserve love if you are a good boy, good girl, if you behave well, if you achieve, or if you're pleasing, or if you, you, know, if you correspond to other people's expectations. So naturally, you wouldn't risk to fail, because if you fail, you won't be loved by yourself, you won't be allowed to love and respect yourself. So we'd rather not even go into that. And I think your core premise is that your self love is really the only love that actually matters. Is that right? Yes. And there are very many different reasons. First of all, your self-love defines how you present yourself to the world. You are your first critic. And very often we teach other people how to treat us. There was this recent research, which is absolutely logical. I don't know even why they did the research on that, that says that when you are finding a new job or applying for a new job, you're going to be paid according to how you consider, how worthy you consider yourself to be. I've experienced that in real life. And that's natural because how is anybody going to pay you for what you're really worth if they don't even know you? So the only way how they what they can go by is how do you think yourself being worthy? So that's one of the things why your self-love is important because you do teach people how to treat yourself. And I'm sure you can think of countless examples of people who are so confident in themselves, you know, like this... Um, uh, God, this Austin Powers character, right? <laughs> no matter how pathetic... How pathetic he is. Uh, but he has a very strong self-belief. And by the end of the movie, you start seeing him the way he sees himself. And, and we have this kind of Austin Powers people around us, left and right. So that's one of the reasons. The other reason is a little more philosophical. No matter what we think about our loved ones, whether it's our children, our parents, our partners, lovers, friends, none of them has the obligation to love you. None of them. Nobody has to love you. Yes, you might expect, you might want that your darling children love you, but they don't have the obligation to do that. The only person whose love you can reasonably expect is your own. And that's a bitter pill to swallow. It's a super powerful way to wrap up, you know, to, to that's the most important message, isn't it? Go deep and find that self-love and your world will become a little bit more understandable. Mm -hmm. Your book Becoming Flawsome. It's available wherever you buy books, but also at mindvalley.com forward slash flawsome. We've been chatting with Christina Mandlachiani. This is episode 1017. We'll put a couple of notes and some links off to resources uh, where you see this episode on jamesramco.com. Christina, it's been so nice to, to chat about this stuff. Uh, I can see that you're super passionate about it and you've done a lot of work, especially finding all those editors and getting the right channel to get this book out there. You know, this might be the greatest uh, thing on this topic since uh, that, that old Japanese thing, Wabi Sabi. You know, it's, it's a, another good message to the world that it's okay to be you and let go of that perfect idea of what you think you should be so that you, you don't have to beat yourself up. And, and enjoy life better. Can I tell one more little detail to that last message? Is that Please. 
not only it's okay to be you and to accept your dragons, but very often when you go, go down that path, what you discover is that the very things that you thought were your imperfections, your dragons, your flaws, these are the very things hold the key to your biggest strength and the biggest value you have to give to the world. And that's, uh, that's a twist at the end of the journey. I can agree with that. I, one of my very first audio products, I was at a conference in Las Vegas and I was beside this other guy and he said, oh, I've, I've got your product. He said, your voice is so boring. And uh, I, I guess that's one reason why I cranked out so many podcasts because I was going to want to keep improving, you know, I want to actually think, okay, well, the first question I asked, is he right? And in fairness, I, I probably was a little bit dry in that product. So it's good to evaluate, but it didn't stop me. And I think that's the most important thing. I, I took it on board and I thought, you know what, I can develop this and still be okay with it. And even if people don't like it, well, it's bad luck. The information's still good. Well, I, I do not know. Um, I mean, you probably, I mean, uh, 1,000 episodes, <laughs> you probably have improved massively, but I would say your voice is steady and calming and grounding, and that's very good. That's amazing. That's super kind. I hope we can have you back to talk about, you know what, I have a suspicion that you might have more books coming out after this. I think you're <laughs> my book's about six years old now and I've got a couple coming through the machine very slowly because it's so difficult for me, the book thing. I do hold them pretty close. Uh, but as they come out, I'd love to give them a spotlight. Uh, I know our audience are going to go out there and uh, show you some love as well. I think working on yourself has to be a top priority in life. So it'd be great to catch up. Thank you, James, for having me and for giving me this opportunity. This is James Schramko.